I, I, I've come to promote a, um, a book called Misunderstanding the Internet, which I've co-authored, which comes out, published by Routledge next month. So that's not really why I've come. Um, I've come to come to Dr. Um, my father um, thought he was Irish. He had absolutely no connection with Ireland, but he still thought he was Irish. And he filled my head with fantasy and romance about things Irish. Um, so the last time I was in Ireland was a couple of years ago, University of Galway, the conference. And I checked in at the hotel bar about 11 o'clock. And the next door table, people were talking about the seventh century poem of Beowulf. Mm -hmm. And I assumed there were taxi drivers that just finished their shift, or factory workers that just finished their shift. Um, I thought, God, isn't this wonderful? And then I was horrified to find the next day. They were historians attending the same conference with me. Um, but I'm still filled with fantasy about um, coming to Dublin, um, which is why. Um, I'm going to talk about what people said the internet would do in the mid-1990s and compare their predictions with what has actually happened. Um, and I'm going to start with global understanding. During the 1990s, there was a broad consensus that the internet would promote greater global understanding. The internet declared the US Republican politician Vern Ehlers will create a community of informed, interacting and tolerant world citizens. The internet concurred bullish over and coal offers quote a tremendous peace dividend resulting from improved communications with and improved knowledge of other people, countries and cultures. One key reason for this, argues the writer Harley Hahn, is not just that the internet is a global medium, but also it offers greater opportunity for ordinary people to communicate with each other than do traditional media. Quote, I see the internet as being our best hope for the world, finally starting to become a global community and everybody just, just getting along with everybody else. Another reason for optimism, according to numerous commentators such as Francis Cairncross, is that the internet is less subject to national state censorship than traditional media and is thus better able to host a free, unconstrained global discourse between citizens. These themes, the internet's international scale, user participation and freedom, continued to be invoked in the 2000s as grounds for thinking that, it, that the internet is bonding the world in growing amity. And here I'll skip in order to conform to my time a whole lot of academic experts. The central weakness of all this theorising is that it extrapolates consequences from the technology of the internet what this overlooks is the multiple ways in which the wider context of society limits and even negates the contribution that the internet makes to global harmony and understanding. Let us consider just seven limitations. First, the world is very unequal, and this limits participation in an internet-mediated global dialogue. The richest 2% of adults in the world own more than half of global household wealth, with the richest 1% of adults alone possessing 40% of global assets in 2000. Adults making up the bottom half of the world population own barely 1% of global wealth. Davis et al. notes that wealth is concentrated in North America, Europe, and high-income Asia-Pacific countries. People in these countries hold almost 90% of total world wealth. These rich countries have a very high internet access. 77% of North Americans have internet access, 61% in Oceania, Australia, and 58% of Europeans. That's in 2010. There are many developing countries have, that have internet penetration rates that are less than one hundredth of those in wealthy countries. This skews the composition of the internet community. The total proportion of the population who are internet users in 2011 
is 30%. So if the internet is bringing the world together, it is primarily the affluent who are being brought into communion with each other. Much of the world's poor are not part of this magic circle of quote-unquote mutual understanding. Second, the world is divided by language. Most people can only speak one language and so cannot comprehend, literally, what foreigners say. The nearest thing to a shared online language is English, which, according to the ITU, only 15% of the world's population understands. The role of the internet in bringing people together is thus hampered by mutual incomprehension. Third, language is a medium of power. Those writing or speaking in English can reach, in relative terms, a large global public. By contrast, those conversing in Arabic are only able to communicate potentially to 3% of internet users in 2010. And those communicating in Marathi potentially reach a percentage of internet users so small as to be measurable only in decimal points. The Marathi population, of course, is bigger than that of Britain. Who gets to be heard online in the global community often depends on their mother tongue. Fourth, the world is divided by conflicts of interests and values. These can find expression in websites that ferment rather than assuage animosity. Thus, there has been a proliferation of race-hate websites. At this point, I should be showing you one of these scary websites, but I'm going to show you later something more jolly. The Raymond Franklin list of such sites runs to 170 pages. Some of these sites have a large base. Stormfront, one of the earliest white-only US websites, had 52,566 active users in 2005. Detailed studies of hate sites conclude they maintain and extend racial hatred in a variety of ways. They can foster a sense of collective identity, reassuring militant racists that they are not alone. Some promote a sense of community, not only through features like an Aryan dating page, but also through more conventional content such as forums discussing health, fitness and homemaking. The more sophisticated are adept at targeting children and young people by, for example, offering online games and practical help. Race hate groups increasingly use the internet to develop international networks of support in which ideas and information are shared. And of course, their staple content is designed to promote fear and hatred, typified by warnings of the demographic time bomb of alien procreation in their midst. These white fortresses of cyberspace promote not just disharmony, there is a relationship between racist discourse and racist violence. This illustrates one central point. The internet can spew out hatred, foster misunderstanding, and perpetuate animosity. Because the internet is both international and interactive, this does not mean necessarily that it encourages only sweetness and light. Fifth, national and localist cultures are still strongly embedded in much of society, in contrast to the cosmopolitan temper of academic and journalistic life. These cultures are supported by the organisation and values of traditional news media throughout the world. Thus, news media continue, uh, tend to concentrate on domestic news. For example, in 2007, the American TV network news devoted only 20% of its time to foreign news, while even its counterparts in two internationalist Nordic countries allocated just 30%. Insular news values also shape the content of the press and these in other countries. Above all, nation-centred cultures shape the content of internet-mediated news. A study of leading news websites in nine nations across four continents in 2010 found that these publish mainly national news and are only marginally more internationalist than our leading television news programmes. Six, national governments seek everywhere to manage or control their media systems. In particular, authoritarian regimes develop new ways of censoring online communication 
principally through licensing internet service providers and websites, through filtering out errors on a, an official blacklist, through software that monitors internet content and use, and through creating a general climate of intimidation and fear. As a consequence, global internet discourse is distorted by state intimidation and censorship. Seventh, people who actively participate in politics can be untypical of the general population, and this can influence the nature of online discourse. Smith et al. discovered that in the US, the advantage tended to be the most active in politics, and this is reproduced in online activism. Similarly, De Gennaro and Stutton found that in Britain, the politically active tend to be drawn from the higher socioeconomic groups, the more highly educated and older people. Those engaged in political online participation were even more skewed towards the affluent and highly educated, although they were often younger. De Gennaro and Stutton's conclusion is that the internet seems to be promoting political exclusion rather than in inclusion. In short, the idea that cyberspace is a free, open space where people from different backgrounds and nations commune with each other and build a more deliberative, tolerant and empowered world overlooks a number of things. The world is unequal and mutually incomprehending, uncomprehending in a literal sense. It's torn asunder by conflicting values and interests. It is subdivided by deeply embedded national and local cultures and other modes of identity such as religion and ethnicity. And some countries are ruled by authoritarian regimes. These different aspects of the real world penetrate cyberspace, producing a ruined tower of Babel with multiple languages, hate websites, nationalist discourse, censored speech, and over-representation of the advantage. Yet, there are forces of a different kind influencing the development of society, increasing migration, cheap travel, mass tourism, global market integration, and the globalization of entertainment have encouraged an increased sense of transnational connection. Some of these developments find support in the internet. YouTube showcase, showcases shared experience, music and humor from around the world that promotes a we feeling. Let me show you an excerpt from YouTube that is funny in any language, overcoming the deadening effects of subtitles. I think it's sound. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, it sounds like You haven't got sound. Um, sound is absolutely crucial to the funniness <laughs> of the It's a stand up comedian. Um, and the intonation of the voice. Um, um, why don't you have just sort of a. a, a, a a small section. Um, it's just a light. Okay, why not? It's generally very fun. Uh, even though it's in Chinese. Um, <laughs> 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 I will roll with love, I promise you. Um, <laughs> and it illustrates the idea that um, a shared cultural experience, you know, a shared sense of humour, promotes a sense of solidarity. And it's an ice cream break from a boring paper. Um, but, but the ice cream break comes later. Um, with, with drop down features. The internet also facilitates rapid global distribution of arresting images that strengthen a sense of solidarity between beleaguered groups, whether these are earthquake victims or protesters facing repression in distant lands. The internet has the potential to assist the building of a more cohesive understanding and fairer world. But the mainspring of change will come from society, not from the internet. The uprisings in the Middle East are part a testament to the power of the internet, mobile phone and satellite TV to mobilize dissent and to win support from outside the Middle East. That said, these uprisings also have deep underlying causes. They aren't simply a Twitter revolution. They haven't been produced by technology. They've been produced by deep underlying causes, disappointed expectations, following rapid educational advance, high youth unemployment, rising food prices, unpopular neoliberal policies, resentment against crony capitalism and authoritarian rule, and in some cases, tribal and religious enmity. These uprisings were prefigured by strikes and protests in Egypt, Tunisia, and elsewhere, extending back to the 1980s. Indeed, 
and this strikes me as being a key point. What is striking is that out of the six actively insurgent countries, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, Syria, and Yemen, only Bahrain features in the top five rankings of Arab countries for Facebook penetration and internet use. They have much lower internet use and Facebook penetration than, say, Morocco or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates. And yet, those countries with a higher internet penetration didn't turn on their dictators, which underlines the point that the uprisings in the insurgent countries are caused primarily by um, other factors than technology. Um, I'm racing ahead. Let me turn to another issue, journalism renaissance. The internet, according to Rupert Murdoch, is democratizing journalism. Quote, power is moving away, he declares, from the old elite in our industry, the editors, the chief executives, and let's face it, the proprietors, end of quote, and is being transferred to bloggers, social networks, and consumers downloading from the web. This view is echoed by the leading British conservative blogger Guido Fawkes, who proclaimed that, quote, the days of media conglomerates determining the news in a top-down, forward fashion are over. The radical academic lawyer Yokai Benkler concurs, arguing that the monopolistic industrial model of journalism is giving way to a pluralist network model based on profit and non-profit, individual and organised journalistic practice. The radical press historian, um, welcome John, the radical press historian um, John Narone goes further, pronouncing the ancien regime to be a thing of the past, quote, the biggest thing to lament about the death of the old order of journalism, he declares, is that it is not there for us to piss on anymore. Thus, numerous commentators, drawn from the left as well as the right, and including news industry leaders, citizen journalists, and academic experts, have reached the same conclusion. The internet is bringing to an end the era of media moguls and conglomerate control of journalism. The second related theme of this euphoric commentary is that the internet will lead to the reinvention of journalism in a better form. The internet will be, quote, journalism's ultimate liberation, according to Philip Elmer Dewitt, because, quote, anyone with a computer and a m m modem can be his own reporter, editor, and publisher, spreading news and views to millions of readers around the world, end of quote. One version of this vision sees traditional media being displaced by citizen journalists, and a turn to version sees professional journalists working in tandem with enthusiastic volunteers to produce a reinvigorated form of journalism. In brief, we are told that the internet will bury the old order of journalism and give rise to its reinvention in a better form. The first reason for questioning this, for questioning this is that television is still the dominant news media. Thus, in six countries, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, the United States, and Japan, surveyed in 2010, more respondents said they relied on television rather than the internet as their main source of news about their country. More importantly, leading news organizations have colonized cyberspace. To preempt competition, they set up satellite news websites. These quickly became dominant because they were heavily cross-subsidized and exploited the news <coughs> gathering resources and established reputations of their powerful parent companies. Thus, Pew Research Centre found that in 2010, 80% of internet traffic to news and information sites is concentrated on the top 7% of sites. The majority of these top sites, 67%, are controlled by dominant news organisations from the pre-internet era. era. Another 13% are accounted for by content aggregators. Only 14% of these top sites are online-only operations that produce mostly original repertorial content. In other words, the rise of the internet has not undermined leading news organisations. On the contrary, 
it has enabled them to extend their hegemony across technologies. In concrete terms, this means that the 10 most visited newspaper websites in the world in 2010-11 included only one online independent, the Huffington Post. The remaining nine were leading news organizations like the New York Times and Guardian from the pre-internet era. The top 10 news websites in the US in March 2011 included only one online independent, again the Huffington Post. The remainder were four leading TV organisations, three leading newspapers and two content aggregators. In Britain, there was no online independent among the top 10 news sites in 2011. All the top spots were filled by leading television newspaper organisations and content aggregators. It should be noted that content aggregators <coughs> do not usually give provenance to alternative news sources. Thus, Joanna Redden and Tamara Vicha examined Google's and Yahoo's listing of content over time in relation to five major public issues, only to find that, quote, no alternative news site were returned in the first page of search results, end of quote. Nor is the internet connected a legion of bloggers to a mass audience. Certainly in Britain, 79% of internet users in 2008 had not read a single blog during the previous three months. Most bloggers lack the time to investigate stories. They are amateurs who need their day job to pay their way. This reduces their ability to build a large audience. There are, of course, exceptions. A blogger who works for the disabled can break these stories and reach a large audience. Um, but if the old order is still often in control, has journalism got better? One consequence of the rise of the internet has been to divert advertising away from old media and to a lesser extent for news production in general. The total number of journalists employed in the US declined by 26% between 2000 and 2009, while those employed in the UK's mainstream journalism course shrunk by 27% between 2001 and 2010. News budgets have also been cut, with the result that even the large metropolitan dailies and television networks in the US, the big journalists and superstores, have been forced to economise on time-consuming investigative journalism and high-cost foreign journalism. A major study of British journalism also concludes that a more profound and pervasive process of deterioration is taking place, in marked contrast to hype predictions of regeneration. He found that fewer journalists are being expected to produce more content as a cons consequence of newsroom redundancies, the integration of online and offline news production, and the need to update stories in a 24-hour news cycle. This is encouraging journalists to rely more on tried and tested news sources as a way of boosting output. It is also fostering the lifting of stories from rival websites as a way of increasing productivity, even to the extent of using the same news frames, quotes, and pictures. Depleted resources are contributing in general to increased reliance on scissors and paste, desk-bound journalism. To judge from an Argentinian study, a very similar trend towards imitative office-centered journalism is also taking place elsewhere. While some journalistic green shoots have appeared, they have mostly been sickly. Independent online news ventures have found it difficult in independent, to build a subscription base because the public have been accustomed to having free web content. And because these online <coughs> independents have generally attracted small audiences, they have low advertising returns. A 2009 Pew Research Center study in the US concluded that, quote, Despite enthusiasm and good work, few of any of these independents are profitable or even self-financing, end of quote. Similarly, a 2009 Columbia Journalism Review study concluded that, quote, it is unlikely that any but the smallest of these web-based news organizations can be supported primarily by existing online revenue, end of quote. Often with skeletal resources, these independents' most pressing priority has usually been to stay alive. In brief, the dominant news organisations have entrenched their ascendancy because they have gained a commanding position in both the offline and online production and consumption of news. 
In addition, the rise of the internet as an advertising medium <coughs> has led to budget cuts, increased time pressure on journalists, and sometimes falling quality in mainstream <coughs> journalism. This has not been offset by new independent new startups because they have both mostly been too small and with too little firepower to ride to the rescue. This needs to be qualified, and it will be qualified um, by an eloquent exposition from people along the sides of the table. Um, it also needs to be qualified in terms of geographical variation. Thus, in South Korea, the citizen newspaper website Oh My News, with a core staff supported by a large number of volunteer reporters, built a mass audience in the early 2000s. However, the website's takeoff was sustained by a generational protest against cultural conformism and a political protest against government corporate cronyism. When the wind behind the website subsided later in the, de the decade, Oh My News ran into difficulty, and its attempt to establish a similar venture in the less fertile soil of Japan was a flop. Let me, in my remaining time, um, turn to um, economic transformation. Um, between 1995 and 2000, it was widely claimed that the internet would generate wealth and prosperity for all. Typifying this prediction was a long article in Wild, the Bible of the American internet community, written by the magazine's editor Kevin Kelly in 1999. It's a title and lead-in set the set the article's tone. The roaring zeros. The good news is you'll be a millionaire soon. The bad news is so will everybody else. <laughs> this good news was widely reported across both sides of the Atlantic, though not in such hyperbolic terms. It was underpinned by seemingly authoritative reports that the internet would transform the economy. In the words of Business Week, we have entered the age of the internet. The result an explosion of economic and productivity growth, first in the US, with the rest of the world soon to follow, end of quote. Central to these predictions is the idea that the internet and digital communication will build the new economy. While this concept is amorphous and mutable, it usually means, it usually invokes certain themes. Um, the internet provides, we are told, a new, more efficient means of connecting suppliers, producers, and consumers that is increasing productivity and growth. The internet is a disruptive technology that is generating a Schumpeterian wave of innovation, and it's leading to the growth of a new information economy that will replace heavy industry as a main source of wealth in deindustrializing Western society. At the heart of this theorizing, is a mystical call. This proclaims that the internet is changing the terms of competition by establishing a level playing field between corporate giants and new startups. The internet is consequently renewing the dynamism of the market and unleashing a whirlwind force of business creativity. By bypassing established retail intermediaries, the internet is carving out new market opportunities. It is lowering costs and enabling low volume producers to satisfy neglected niche demand in the global market. The internet also favors, we inform, horizontal, flexible network enterprise able to respond rapidly to changes in market demand, unlike heavy footed, top down, for this giant corporations. The concept of the new economy is often cloaked in specialist language. To understand its insights, it is seemingly necessary to learn a new vocabulary, to distinguish between portal and portal, to differentiate between internet, intranet, and extranet, to assimilate buzz concepts like click, click and mortar and data warehousing, and to be familiar with endless acronyms like CRM, Customer Relationship Management, BAM, Value Added Network, ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, OLTP, Online Transaction Processing, and ETL, extract, transform, and load. So to be part of the novitiate who understands the future, it is first necessary to master a new catechism. But if this insider language is set to one side, it's possible to formulate certain cautious conclusions. The first is the intent of course has changed the nerve system of the economy and has resulted in quite profound economic changes. Um, the second conclusion is the internet has not proved to be a geezer of wealth, 
cascading down investors and the general public. Um, I'm rushing because I'm going to be a very obedient um, 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 uh, uh, subject. Um, the third, and, and I'm happy to leave out evidence for that, the third and much the most important conclusion is that the internet has not created a level playing field between small and large enterprise. The belief that it would was a principal evangelical component of the new economy thesis and lay at the heart of the conviction that the internet would generate a surge of innovation and growth. This article of faith did not anticipate the differences that small and medium firms would continue to have in penetrating foreign markets. As it turned out, the usefulness, usefulness of the internet as a tool for securing foreign market access was constrained by language, cultural knowledge, the quality of telecommunications infrastructures, and foreign um, net skills and access. More importantly, the new economy thesis failed to take adequately into account the continuing economic advantage of corporate size. Large corporations have bigger budgets and greater access to capital than small companies. They have economies of scale, maybe lower unit cost of productions, economies of scope based on the sharing of services and cross promotion, and concentrations of expertise and resources that the system to launch successful new products and services. They can seek also to undermine under-resourced competition by temporarily lowering price and by exploiting their marketing and promotional advantage. In addition, they can try and buy success by acquiring promising young companies, the standard strategy of conglomerates. I will then quote, but I haven't got time, statistics showing that large corporations have increased their market size, uh, share um, in major segments of the American market. In brief, the triumph of the small business in the internet era have never happened because competition remained unequal. Corporate Goliaths continue to squash commercial Davids, armed only with a virtual sling and pebble. In conclusion, there are other prophecies that I've not had time here to evaluate, but let me make one last point. The reason why so many wide-eyed predictions about the internet proved to be wrong, notwithstanding the fact that the internet, of course, is making significant changes, was because society influenced the internet more than the other way around. Seems to be the key point. This is not a novel insight. In the mid-19th century, it became the convention to spell the newspaper press with a capital NP, in awestruck anticipation of how the rise of the popular press would change the world, in much the way we currently spell the internet with a capital I. However, it was discovered that the popular press did not become an autonomous instrument of rational and moral instruction, as had been hoped, but instead reflected the people who controlled and bought popular newspapers. This led more skeptical but better informed commentators to decapitalize the newspaper press from the 1880s onwards. Perhaps we should do the same in relation to the internet. Thank you. Professor.